was visiting my grandmother for the holiday season and I went out to a bar with some friends of mine and had had a drink and went home in the morning to my grandmother's mm -hmm. and then the next thing I remember I was waking up four days later in the hospital and apparently somebody put something in my drink and I was poisoned and went into a coma for four days. Wow. When I had my daughter in January of 1990, I suddenly became very, very ill. I um, was diagnosed with uh, complex partial epilepsy. And what that meant was that I went from having a little blank space from here and there to being so ill I could no longer work. Uh, during that time, I went through a divorce. And so I became a single parent with a child. I was too ill to work lost the husband's uh, insurance and came to a point in my life where I had no medical care and no hope of getting any. So I, they, let me, they released me from the hospital after being there for four days and I don't have any insurance. $42,500 is the total of all my medical Jeez. expenses. A recent example that just happened this week, a patient who really had a very minor problem um, led to about a $5,000 workup in the emergency room being done wow. to evaluate a, a non-problem, mm -hmm. you know, because she was well insured at great expense mm -hmm. with really no benefit. Right. And on, on the very same day, I can't get a very, very, very important study done, a mammogram mm -hmm. on a patient with a breast lump who has no insurance and no access. A man named Douglas Schmidt in his mid-30s who had a seizure disorder could no longer access the medications that controlled his seizures. So he's still covered by Medicaid, but the program no longer covers the medication. After 10 days, he had a sustained grand mal seizure and ended up with severe brain damage in Good Samaritan Hospital on a ventilator. And he was in the ICU for several months, then he was transferred to a long-term care facility and he died in November of 2003 when life support was withdrawn. The cost of his medications were about $14 a day. The cost of his ICU visit exceeded $7,500 a day. Total bill of over a million dollars that was billed right back to the state Medicaid program. So we didn't save any money through this implicit rationing decision. In fact, we increased our fiscal liability and in order to absorb it, we dropped more people from covering coverage, perpetuating this kind of fiscal disaster and this kind of human tragedy. It just counterpoint of how our system fails to really deal with things at an early stage when they can be managed mm -hmm. and will spend a lot of money on other things that really don't improve health outcomes. I was one of the first people to sign up for the Oregon Health Plan. I immediately took my card. I went to the pharmacy. I went to the doctor. I got Neurontin and I got a number of other medications and within six weeks I was back to work full time on private insurance at a full time paying job. The Oregon Health Plan kept me off welfare. The Oregon Health Plan let me go back to a good paying job using my educational background and contributing to our tax base instead of being a burden on the system. We've dropped almost 70,000 people off the Oregon Health Plan in the last two years by manipulating eligibility, essentially. The private sector does it by either dropping coverage altogether, which is happening at a growing rate in, in, in the private sector, or by increasing co-payments and deductibles that shift out-of-pocket expenses to employees who at some point can no longer afford the cost of the care. And these strategies simply increase the number of people in the coverage gap who go back to the emergency room driving the cycle over and over again. Now, this arrangement defies logic and common sense, uh, but it also costs us far more as a society to leave a significant portion of the population without the ability to pay for needed care than it would be if we stepped up and ensured people coverage on the front end. We organize and compensate the system for the fanciest care, really, the Cadillac care, and under-finance and plan the system for the most basic, preventive, economical, cost-worthy care. For 50 million Americans uh, who have nothing, uh, the healthcare, the quality of the healthcare could not possibly get worse. It's not the just a poor strip of people or people who can't seem to uh, 
haven't grabbed hold or, or just got laid off. It's people who are actually doing everything right. I think people have been beaten down with the system. It's just, and it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. It's just getting worse. If you compare and contrast um, Oregon in particular, but the United States in general, with other countries that have the same kind of society, basically, that we do in the mm -hmm. United States, you see that we treat our patients abysmally, uh, people with medical conditions abysmally. It's a, it's a source of shame. We spend probably close to over $6,000 per capita each year on health care in this country. Italy spends about $2,000 and has much better population health statistics. Yeah, even the Mexican health care system, such as it is, with all the millions of people who are left out of it, is a, is a system, I think, preferable to our own for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. The healthcare system has very little to do with health. It's an, almost an oxymoron. The healthcare system is about the financing and delivery of healthcare as an economic commodity. Our healthcare system has been held hostage to the political system of well funded pharmaceutical lobbyists and an overly powerful uh, Oregon Medi Medical Association and American Medical Association. We know that we're facing a crisis as a state and as a country. We are running out of time here. We are way beyond the point that incremental change is going to solve this issue. What we need is a revolution.